Hello and welcome to Hollywood Crime Scene. I am your host, Joe Hollywood. And once again, I am joined by Imagine O's Pete. Hey, hey. And Andrew, the Maltese Falcon Walker. That's right. The one and only, baby. <laughs> and I still need to watch that movie. It's the stuff uh, that un- dreams are made of. Unbelievable. No, it's, it's very believable. <laughs> very, very believable. <laughs> Nick and I, Nick. Imagine those Pete and I <laughs> have a little bet on what percentage of movies you have seen that is on our list. So hopefully we are pleasantly surprised. For our, for our fans out in Nevada, the over-under is two. <laughs> <laughs> so log in to sportsbetting.com right now. Or DraftKings. And there, there you go. <laughs> so we're going to deviate a little bit from our normal subject matter uh true life true crime unsolved mysteries and murders um this the show is kind of inspired by film noir uh the black and white rainy moody uh, movies from the golden age that usually involve a femme fatale and a poor dope that gets uh, roped into her scheme and uh a lot of other topics we've touched on before in this pa- uh, podcast. Yep. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about film noir and movies uh, that incorporate the elements that make uh, a film noir a good film. I've been obsessed with uh, noir films over the past few years. I've been trying to watch as many as I can. And, of course, I have my favorites and as I was trying to rank my films, trying to figure out what my favorites are, sort of a, a rule of thumb is if I can remember what the story is about, then yeah, it was one of my favorites. But <laughs> I, I'm looking at lists of like, you know, the top film noir movies, and I recognize the title, but I'm like, man, I can't for the life of me remember what the story was about. And, and I've actually heard a director once say, that it doesn't matter if the uh, the audience is following along or understand the plot, as long as they're having fun. And so a lot of times when it comes to these noir films, I can't, I don't know what's going on, and sometimes I just can't remember what the heck the movie was about, but it was a good time. It was it was fun. I feel like Michael Bay took that to the extreme. <laughs> it doesn't matter what's going on in my movie. I don't <laughs> like, sure, Michael. Yeah. Or your favorite director, uh, Mr. Nolan, how many times have you watched a Christopher Nolan film where you're like, I don't know what's going on, but I'm having a blast? Uh, definitely uh, Tenet. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Well, I'm like that with, uh, what's, the, what's the one with the dreams? The uh, Inception. Inception. Like, uh, yeah. That, that doesn't make any sense, but it's, it's, very, it's entertaining. It's very mathematical, the way everything works. And, and that's the, the layers. And, right, and, and, that's, yeah. and seeing that, as on a blockbuster screen for the first time, your mind is geared more towards emotional things, not all the mathematical things that go in, into a Christopher Nolan movie. Right. That's why I say you got to watch his films a, a couple times to really get yeah. what's going on. I feel on. like Nolan was right there with Inception. Then with Tenet, he kind of whoops. <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was a little much. Like the guardrails yeah. are off. So, what elements, in your opinion, uh, enters a movie in the film noir? category because i i look at some lists and i'm like i don't know if that qualifies like sometimes someone will pick like a heist film or something and i'm like eh, i don't know if a heist film qualifies unless it contains some other elements for me personally there has to be some some sort of romance angle where the the schlub the victim the mark the detective uh, is sort of coerced into doing something by the promises of the femme fatale. Of course, there has to be a villain yeah. somewhere in there, whether it's a husband yeah. or ex-lover or something. I, um, I would also add, yeah, there, there has to be a clear uh, antagonist. Yep. Um, it it needs to mostly take place more uh, in maybe like a lower class area. Yep. Uh, with the occasional luxury, like if 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 the crime boss, you know, uh, has has some luxury or whatever, um, yeah, kind of like the Titanic, where 
you have your different classes and it's more fun if you get to explore those various classes. So, yes. so yes. yeah, maybe, you know, the femme fatale, maybe she's from, you know, a penthouse apartment, but then there's a, another blonde ingenue who's, you know, room in a rooming house, which is a, another common element of noir films is everyone lives in a rooming house of some sort. I think also is, is stylistically, a lot of it takes place uh, in dark settings at, at night. Yeah. With yeah. rain, usually. With rain. Um, Which forces the detective to wear a trench coat and a yep. fedora. It's, yeah, it's very uh, stylistic. It's a very dour movie. Um, uh, maybe non-conventional uh, film shots and angles. Mm -hmm. uh, twists are important. Yeah. Betrayals. Just when you yes. think, you yes. know, uh, someone has promised, oh, no, everything will be fine. Then they stab you in the back. It, it, There's got to be twists and betrayals. For example, if the the protagonist like if he's a detective or whatever maybe his boss turns out you know to be a, a bad guy or yeah uh a, a corrupt a business leader a gang leader police there's, there, officer yeah yeah. There, yeah there's there's some sort of crime there's something going on underneath the surface that he's got to get to the bottom of it From and uh if the the traditionally you know the the femme fatale Maybe she's good. Maybe she's bad. Maybe exactly. she's a little bit of both. Uh, you don't know till the end. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. From everything that I've read and understood, and from everything, all those topics that we've covered ever since we started this podcast, it it comes down to um, there's this era of pessimism. The good guy doesn't have to win. The main mm -hmm. character doesn't have to win. Not even the good yeah. guy, because the main character is not always a good guy. Yeah. As we've seen before. I guess what we we, we would call today an antihero, right? Right. Exactly. But and I don't think that term. No, I mean, it, it was it, that it, back then, but yeah, that, that's true. Yeah. I mean, and uh, as much as they say, they say the femme fatale, they it seems like almost every movie had their counterpoint in there. Mm -hmm. It's also what what I got garnered from all the, the research, yeah. So, yeah, there was the good girl, there was yeah. the bad girl, and the good girl loved the protagonist, but the protagonist had his sights set on the bad girl. Um, another element that's in a lot of these types of movies is something called the MacGuffin. And the MacGuffin is an object, usually an inanimate object, that people are chasing after. It moves the story along. along. It may or may not necessarily pay off in the movie, um, but it's just sort of a gimmick almost to kind of keep the story moving along. Is, is it the, the aforementioned MF? Yes, yes. Okay. So, you know, in, in the Maltese Falcon, uh, i got to say that carefully, the Maltese Falcon, um, you know, all these uh, eccentric characters are chasing after this rumored bird that's yep. encrusted in jewels, and we never see it till like, the end of the film. But that's what drives the movie. Everyone's chasing yeah. after this. Um, in a movie like Casablanca, it's the letters of transit, um, Rick is uh, entrusted with the letters of transit and anyone who gets their hands on this, these letters of transit are able to leave uh, Casablanca and, and to freedom. Okay. And it's, it's, it just moves the story along, you know, and, um, and those become some of the more famous props in movie history are these MacGuffins that yep. play this role in these films. There's, um, there's one movie um, I'm trying to remember what it was called kiss me deadly i think it's called it's not on my list um but in kiss me deadly it almost uses the same technique that quentin tarantino used in pulp fiction with the briefcase it's like this nondescript box that everyone's after and if you're unlucky enough to open it this bright light illuminates and causes harm and you're like well what is it and they never explain what it is is it radioactive i don't know and that's a classic example of a macguffin like everyone's after this box but nobody quite describes what it is exactly so i love those kind of things yeah. that just helps move the story along absolutely yeah. yeah so i put together a list of movies not necessarily in order but i i may try to pick a couple of my favorites and then uh go from there uh, some are from the more modern era because they're still making noir films today. They're yes, just yeah. not necessarily black and white. Um, yeah. You can make a noir film in color. It doesn't have to be black yes, and white. Yes, and there are some some very good recent ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, one of my favorites uh, is a movie called Double Indemnity. Yep. 
uh, came out in 1944, directed by Billy Wilder. And what's interesting about this movie is I grew up watching My Three Sons in reruns on television, old black and white sitcom starring Fred McMurray. And he was this, you know, loving father to these three sons. And they had uh, Uncle Charlie was kind of their butler or something. I don't know. Um, And so I had grown up knowing Fred McMurray as this fatherly type. And then all of a sudden when I'm older, I'm watching Double Indemnity where he tries to win the favors of a woman by uh, offing her husband. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And apparently prior to my three sons, those were the types of characters that he played in films. Um, But it stars Fred McMurray, Barbara Stanwyck, very, very famous movie. Uh, where Fred McMurray plays an insurance uh, salesman um, who allows Barbara Stanwyck's character to seduce him and convince him to kill the husband um, for an insurance policy or something. And it's just full of twists and turns and betrayal, and it's just just great. One of the all-time great noir films uh, Edward G. Robinson is an insurance investigator who's trying to solve this crime, and uh, it's awesome. And the funny thing about a lot of these uh, movies, I don't know if you've ever seen a Steve Martin film called Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid. Have you ever seen it? I've, I've heard of it, but I haven't It's seen it. brilliant, and I think it's one of the most underrated yeah. movies I've ever seen. Basically, it's Carl Reiner, Steve Martin. They take clips from old noir films and work them into a new story where Steve Martin is the detective, the protagonist, Rachel Ward is the femme fatale. And as they move the story along, they seamlessly cut in scenes from these classic films where Steve Martin's interacting with Humphrey Bogart and stuff. So how did they get the rights to They to those? somehow got the rights. This this movie came out in the 80s, I think. Imagine trying to do that today. Oh, that would be I- Impossible. Tough. Unless it was like, if it was a Warner Brothers production, Warner Brothers did a lot of these types of films, yeah. so they might retain the rights to these it's films. In their yeah. That's really cool. But if you get a I chance, see, check I, out Dead I, Men I, Don't Wear Plaid. I'm going to see if that's streaming, because I, yeah. of yeah. course I love Steve Martin, and that's a... A brilliant uh, concept. It is. I, I don't know why it wasn't a bigger hit. It's I, sort it, of a lost comedy. You guys are talking about Steve Martin and murder, and I just season three of Only Murders in the Building. Just, just. I heard out. it's good. I haven't. It, seen it. If you get a chance, it's and it's it has some noir yeah. traits in it, but it's it's a it's a wonderfully done series. But no, I um, yeah, I, I have not seen. Andrew, I'm going to join us. I have not seen the Steve Martin movie, so now that's on my list. All right, so add that to your list. Yeah. Have you seen Double Indemnity? Yes, yes. I have. What's your opinion of Double Indemnity? I I put it on the Mount Rushmore of film noir. It's I right agree. up there with Maltese Falcon for me and uh, Sunset Boulevard. Mm-hmm. Those those are my three. Oh, I don't know who makes my fourth. I never <laughs> I, I never actually. Found I, I could I could make. I'll DOA. have some suggestions. You might you might come up with a fourth by the time we're done. Here. Well, I, my fourth has is L. A. Oh, I mean that's I, I went I went modern on that one. I, I'll I had allow to make room. It. I had yeah. to make room for that one. Yeah, that's definitely one of the the uh the best modern noir films. What do they call that? Neo noir? Is that yes, like a noir. modern Which is just yeah. new noir. Just wait, say wait, it's wait, modern noir. From from my from what I've been uh reading uh researching like 70s on 70s to today's neo noir. Okay. Until yeah. we come up with something. And because they had no shortage of of stuff to draw from. We had Marilyn Monroe, Natalie Wood, Sure. Uh, you, you had all sorts of, you know, unsolved murders that were still happening. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And so you tell any one of those stories, and you got a noir film on your hands. Joe, yeah. was it you that w- was the one that was saying that because of like there were so many deaths? Uh, this actually goes back to what we, you know, how the crime scene because there were so many crimes in L.A. at the time. It was like the wild, wild west mm-hmm. when, when it was first starting off. The cops would say, "Hey, w- when we did William Desmond Taylor, mm-hmm. hey, this is a suicide, <laughs> really? Yeah." And, uh, and and uh, what's it, Virginia Rap? You know, all these murders that didn't get solved or were kind of swept underneath the rug, and then all of a sudden, I think you were saying that in the 30s, you got this, in the early 40s, got the wave of patriotism because of the war. Mm-hmm. And then they said, you know what, let's get back to making these stories. And this was the influence. These things had already been thought about and written. They just kind of pushed it off to the side. And then you had this glut of film noir movies in the 40s on into the 50s and it yeah, focuses it's, on this it's funny you mention that because the movie's not on my list i recently saw it and i really did enjoy it it probably should be on my list but it's funny you mention that because i saw a movie recently called hollywood story and it's cl- has all the classic film noir elements but 
it's loosely based on the real life incident that you just, uh, or not the Thomas Ince one. It was the William Desmond Taylor one. Right, is that? Yeah. And so the movie is that was set. Our first of, episode. Yeah. And so, yep. So the movie is set like a, a, a few years after the William Desmond Taylor m- murder, even though they don't necessarily mention him by name. They describe it exactly. Right. And this film director sort of gets obsessed with it. He wants to tell that story, and he starts to investigate the actual murder, which starts to dig up some ghosts, and he overturns some stones and puts his life in danger. But it's exactly what you're talking about. They were able to... Uh, pull material from Hollywood's past to tell these new film noir stories, which is I find really fascinating. Um, but yeah, if, if anyone out there is listening, you want to sit down, grab a pad, grab a pen, and write some of these titles down, you can either find them streaming or you yep. can um, find them on uh, Amazon or whatever. Um, I just tried looking up a really obscure film just the other night, and it was on Tubi. And I haven't fully explored Tubi yet, but apparently Tubi has a pretty nice free library yes. of films it's you can watch. It's worth checking out. Yeah. What, yeah. what, what movie? Oh, gosh. I'm, I'm in the middle of reading Errol Flynn's autobiography, My okay. Wicked, Wicked Ways. <laughs> and he mentions in the book that he was in his very first film when he was trying to decide what to do with his life. A friend of him said, hey, I want you to act in my film. And he was like, okay. And uh, he plays uh, Fletcher Christian from the Bounty, Mutiny on the Bounty story. And the movie itself is more of a travelogue about Tahiti, but Tahiti had so much history that the filmmaker wanted to tell the story of the Bounty, the Mutiny on the Bounty. So they work it into this travelogue. Um, But it's the very first film that Errol Flynn appears in. And so I'm like, I got to see this. So I went to Tubi, found it, to my amazement. And it's like 1933, so it's a talkie. Wow. And, so uh, early. Yeah. It's wow. very, the movie's very melodramatic. I, I read one review where they said the, the acting performances were like something out of community theater. Um, <laughs> but Errol Harsh. Flynn has a presence. He, right. You can see that he's a natural. So, um, yeah, so if you're looking for these movies, you should be able to find them streaming. And if not, you can find them on Amazon. But, the, uh, gosh, I love discovering these uh, noir films from the 40s and 50s that I've never seen before, and you're sitting there watching them for the very first time, and they're just as entertaining, if not more entertaining, than the movies we're seeing in theaters today. Tubi, who to sponsor us? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. This podcast brought to you by Tubi. Um, well, let's kind of go around the table. I don't want to take up too much time talking about all my movies. We'll sort of come back to me. Do you guys have any uh, film noir favorites out oh, there that yeah. you want to throw out? I got out? a list. Go ahead. <coughs> me? All right. Yeah. Uh, like I said, for me, I, I, it's Maltese, and if I had to pick only two out of my Mount Rushmore, I'd go Maltese and um, L.A. Confidential. Those mm-hmm. those two really, when I first saw them, I saw, oddly enough, I saw L.A. Confidential first before I saw Maltese Falcon. Okay. Mm. Yeah, a movie like L.A. Confidential is so great that it will encourage you to go back and find the movies that inspired it, those noir yeah, films exactly. that have those twists and turns and betrayals and stuff like that. And, and you know, it, it looks at that time period, the 40s of uh, L.A., C.D. L.A. So, yeah, um, yeah. I was 18 when I saw it when it came out in theater in 97. So when I saw it, I said, oh, this is really cool. Like, yeah, it's a film noir. I'm like, noir? Okay, I'm going to go look up noir titles. like, oh. Yeah. Hey, I like Casablanca. Hey, it's Bogey. All right, <laughs> exactly. Maltese Falcon. Well, that's a name that comes up over and over and over. When when you're searching lists of greatest noir films, Bogey's name comes up over and over and over. Most people agree that one of the best noir films is The Big Sleep, uh, 1946, yep. directed by Howard Hawks. Um, and come on, you're teaming up Humphrey Bogart with Lauren Bacall, wow. who basically stole Bogey away from his wife, <laughs> and they they heated up the screen. You allegations. Could, it was all allegations. up on. No, it's, uh, <laughs> that is that is fact. And you can see the chemistry on the screen in, in all their movies. I, I love all the movies they did together. Uh, their first one together was To Have and Have Not, which could also be considered a noir film. Um, For a more modern boy. reference, think Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt in uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That okay. chemistry where you're like, oh, you guys really There's get something on. going on there, yeah. And, and in that movie, To Have and Have Not, they had the uh, famous line where she 
tries teaching him how to whistle. You remember that? Yeah, yeah. You know how to whistle, don't you? Put your lips together and blow. And it's like, ah. Uh. And that's another thing. The, the lines in these noir films, the writing is so great. That might be the, the subtext. best part about film noir is yeah. the writing in it. Yeah, and the double entendres and stuff like that. Um, yeah, yeah. That's why you, that's you have to watch it a couple of times. And then there, sometimes there are some performers that said, you caught that? If you ever come and say, hey, I saw that one scene and, uh, you know, got that reference, like, oh, you were paying attention. Well, look at you. I'm like, yeah. And the funny thing is they could get away with that. I think we were talking about this in one of our earlier episodes. They could get away with double entendre stuff because back then most of the Irish, the, the censorship board was Irish Catholic. And so if you said, well, how do you know what that means? Oh, I don't know. I don't know what that means. I, I have no idea what the double entendre means. You don't, do you? Okay. Well, so that's, you know, go. the great thing about the double entendre is when, when you're a kid or a teenager and you're watching these movies, you don't really pick up on them. And then when you get older and you rewatch them, you go, yep. oh, I see what you're doing for some For some of you out there, Shrek. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's yeah. lots of those. And, and not that this is noir, but right. Grease. Yeah. Uh, man, when I was a kid, I was like, I don't know, nine or something when Grease came out. And I really enjoyed it at one level as a kid. And then as I got older, I was like, Oh, I see what's going on. Well, there, there was so. that one line I, I was here about. Tell me more. Tell me more. Did she put up a fight? And like, <laughs> oh boy, that's not yeah, that well. hasn't aged well <laughs> yeah. in some cases. But uh, Andrew, what, throw throw like a top okay. noir film out. Let me let me uh, ask you guys something because you guys have uh, only spoken about movies in the thirties, forties, and fifties. I mentioned L.A. Confidential. For oh, oh okay, but what ab- what about? Uh, 70s or 80s mm-hmm. uh, neo noir films that you guys like. Are you talking about like, the French Connection? Was well, there's film? one. When you say 80s, there's one that immediately comes to mind, and that's Blade Runner. Oh. <clears throat> Blade yes. Runner, 1982, directed yes. by Ridley Scott, starring Harrison Ford. Yep. Has all the elements of your classic noir films with a science fiction Futuristic. backdrop. Yep. Yep. But that you could strip all that away. If you stripped all that away and set it in a seedy C- Chinatown city in Los Angeles, it's the same movie. Yes. The the The... the Sci-fi elements, the effects are fun to look at, but you you strip all that away, you got a great story. And then also, um, I know uh, really Scott made a couple different versions of it, but the uh, version where Harrison Ford uh, has the voiceover, yeah, I forgot to mention earlier of uh, the protagonist doing the voiceover is another uh, element of stylistic yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, film noir. It, so, it's, it's, yeah, the voiceover narrative. Like, so now, correct um, me if I'm wrong, but I thought. The initial, oh, I know what it was. The initial theatrical release had the voiceover, but Ridley Scott was opposed to it, yeah. and Harrison Ford was opposed to it. And from what I remember hearing, he read it in one take and was like, that's it, I'm done. <laughs> and that's what they ended up using. And if you watch the theatrical, or I'm sorry, the director's cut, I think Ridley Scott got rid of that narration. I, but... I, I have some special edition, which I think may or may, I think it might have it, and I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. anyway. You mentioned Chinatown. Chinatown. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, definitely. yes. Chinatown's on my list. That's seventies. Yep. Um, Reservoir Dogs. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. it. But 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 <laughs> but it's taken in a, in a different direction. It's mm-hmm. taken some elements. It's not full noir, but yeah. it's taken some elements. I was of like, it. if you take it in a different direction, isn't it not noir? <laughs> you go how far? Would you... It does have elements. I agree. Let me ask you this. Of all of Tarantino's movies, which one is the most film noir? Pulp Fiction. That would probably be at the top yeah. of my list, but you know what also has a lot of that is Jackie Brown. Jackie, Jackie Brown, Brown yeah. could yeah. be considered film noir. Yeah. Um, but yeah. The, the, the CD side of Los Angeles. Yeah. The, the and again, crime. twists and turns and betrayals and stuff like yep. that. So. If you want a, a Mulholland Drive. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know you're not a Lynch fan, but I no. I was I was gonna say Mulholland Drive and Blue Velvet. Have you seen Blue Velvet? Yes, excellent. Um, I have another uh, '80s noir film that's come up on this podcast in the past. Who Framed Roger yes. Rabbit? Yes, directed by Robert Zemeckis. Got yes. the femme fatale, the murders, the yep. betrayal, and extremely twist funny. and turns. Yeah, and, and, and dope. Of a main character, yeah. whether it's Roger or or, or uh, right. my man uh, Bob Hoskins. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, again, that has all the classic elements, and 
if if I were to narrow this down to a top ten, maybe even a top five, uh, Roger Rabbit would be on my list. I adore that movie. We'll never see anything like that again because you'll never get Warner and Disney to agree to have all their characters on the screen together again. Um, so <laughs> it was sort of a, a product of its time, and I love it. Yeah, company relations have become real Game of Thrones-ish now. Exactly. Yeah, uh, they don't play well. Talking Chris Nolan, uh, Memento. Yeah, I yeah. think has elements of that. Now, what is that? The one that was backwards? Yeah, or, or yeah, and he, it, where, does he does he lose his memory in that yeah. one or something? He loses his long term memory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's trying to find out who killed uh, his his wife and yeah. That's meets... probably one of the most unique and original takes on the noir film genre. Where I, they, oh yeah, absolutely. they they have the elements, but they just turn it on its head, and, and it's, it's it's riveting. And, and the scenes uh, that are color versus uh, sepia or mm-hmm. whatever, sepia, whatever. Uh, it, it's they're mathematically placed throughout the film perfectly because N- Nolan's got that mind. Like we <laughs> talked about that mathematical mind. Yeah, that people have mapped it out and have done like graphs of yeah. what this movie looks like as a graph it is <laughs> mind-blowing um, i'll just do a just a few more um early early stanley kubrick mid-50s called the killing never seen I've that never seen that one Ooh. okay okay so it's it's uh andrew have you seen it i i own it yeah yeah <laughs> well you know I, what we will mark this day this, this is thing, a historic this, yeah, this is so a historic just, day just, on the podcast yeah i'll just give a couple seconds but it's a, a group of thugs who want to rob a racetrack because um, one of the guys is going to shoot the horse from a distance to, to fix the race. To fix the race. Wow. Then these guys start turning on each other once they find out that, you know, the, either the authorities or another group is on to them. And for, for its time, for 1955, it is a brilliant movie. Hmm. And Fair enough. Really good uh, experimental shots. I mean, this is well, Ku- this yeah, is Kubrick. Ku- Kubrick at like ni- at like thirty years old, like you know, early. It's just called the killing. Not to point yeah. out a plot hole, but is he shooting to kill the horse or shooting to injure the horse? I I, I don't remember remember the. Because if he kill the specific... horse, they're gonna stop the race. <laughs> right. <laughs> they can't fix it. Like, there's shot my horse, man. <laughs> there's anyway. Yeah. Look it up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then stylistically, they're they're not, in my opinion, great movies. One is better than the other, but. Uh, Frank Miller's Sin City. Oh, I love that movie. Yes. And did you guys see The Spirit? Yes. I've never seen The Spirit. I know it's based on a comic, but I've G- never Gabriel, seen it. Gabriel, um, what's that? Yeah, the the G- main actor from Suits, the TV series. Yeah. Uh, Gabriel something. Oh, my God. I don't feel bad. But uh, Sam Jackson's in it. Scarlett, Johan- yeah. Scarlett Johansson. Um, critically, uh, a pretty bad movie, but it's extremely fun to watch. And yeah. it, it is... Visually stunning. Yeah. It ha- it well, the same thing with Sin City. Like, yeah. Sin City, they add, like, those comic booky effects to it. Uh, Mickey Rourke is incredible in it. Bruce Willis is amazing in it. Uh, probably the only complaint I have about Sin City is the bad guy played by, uh, oh, what's his name? Elijah, Elijah Wood. Wood. Oh, yeah. It's that's... so horrific. He's so, it's so it, it, yeah. over-the-top horrific that it, it almost ruins the movie for me but yeah. but it is a I, this is one movie i would describe as a masterpiece it, it really is a masterpiece um but it's a tough watch but uh yeah check out yeah, City. great performances all the way through it, even you know what's the funny part then she never they always drag on her because she never really i guess her agency her reps failed her jessica alba played a damn did really well in that movie jessica alba yeah she, yeah, yeah she, she was great, great in it yep. yeah yeah um, going back to some of the classics, uh, I have some more on my list. If I were to create a film noir, Mount Rushmore, one of the films that would be on there is a movie called Laura uh, oh, yeah. from 1944. It stars Jean Tierney, who's one of the most stunningly beautiful women Hollywood has ever laid eyes on. Um, and, uh, an actor named Dana Andrews. And, the premise, and I don't want to ruin this for anybody, but the the movie kind of starts out with the Gene Tierney's character deceased, and Dana Andrews is the police detective who's investigating it. And Report when it. he's he's given access to her apartment um, to look for clues and stuff, he sees the portrait on the wall, 
And he's like, is that her? And they're like, yeah, that's her. And he becomes like obsessed with the portrait, like falls in love with this portrait. As he digs more into the case, he finds out more about her. And you, you go, you know, man, I think you know, she's dead. And then the <laughs> twists, like you said. Yeah, and it has some fantastic twists and turns. And, oh, it's so darn good. And, you know, me being a, a replica movie prop collector, I remember watching the film one day and I'm like, where is that portrait? Who has that portrait? I got to find the portrait. And I started searching online and I found a post in some forum that showed what looked like the, was the portrait hanging on the wall. And I saw the name of the person who made the post. So I reached out to him through Facebook and I said, uh, you the one that posted in this forum uh, about the uh, Laura portrait. And he re he responded right away and said, yep, that's me. And I said, so what do you have there? Do you have the replica? What do you have? And he goes, I think it was his uncle worked for the movie studio. Whoa. And at the end of production, when things normally would get thrown out and discarded, he took the portrait home and handed it down to his nephew, who now has it hanging on his wall. I see. And I was so jealous. And so uh, I said, can you take like a high res image of it for me? I'd like to print it on canvas or something. He goes, no, I can't do that. Because I think he was afraid of like forgeries. And right, stuff. right. Awesome. Well, to my shock, uh, a, literally a week or two after I had reached out to him, he sends me an eBay link, and somebody was selling a canvas replica of the Laura portrait, and I had to have it. So I bought it. It arrived. I bought a, a frame that was similar to the one used in the film, and that portrait is now hanging above my television in my apartment. Cool. And I just get lost in it. Uh, she's so stunningly beautiful that... I can totally see where this uh, private detective or this police detective was coming from. It's uh, one of my favorite uh, possessions in my collection. Yeah. I mean, if you can, first of all, Joe's uh, collection of uh, movie memorabilia is le near legendary status for our audience <laughs> out there. Yeah. And, you know, my goal when I started putting these this prop collection together, I can't afford the real deal. Like the Maltese Falcon alone, if there's, I think, three proven uh maltese falcons that have survived from the movie one has warner brothers seal of approval on it and when those go up for auction they're in the millions they're, oh. it's like one of the most valuable yeah. props well the one that i own like i said i could afford replicas the one that i own the the seller claims in, in the auction that at one point his family owned one of the original maltese falcon statues and made a mold of it and uh, casted uh, replicas from the mold. And mine supposed, supposedly is cast from the original Maltese Falcon. So Hello. it's uh, it looks right. great on display. Um, but yeah, as I was going through, you know, making a list of some of the most iconic movie props in movie history, a, a lot of the props on the list were these classic you know, 40s era films that had these cool props in it. So, yeah, I got a lot of that kind of stuff. Got Rosebud, the sled, spoiler alert, uh, yeah. up against my wall. So, yeah. Yes? You well, look shocked. You worried about the spoiler? Yeah. Well, well we're Rosebud for what, what movie? <laughs> All right, Andrew. Uh, I, 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 you're trolling us. This is, this is ladies Andrew and gentlemen, I have seen wah, Citizen Kane wah. only one time in college, so it's been 20 years. No, oh, it's, wow. it's so fine. So I'm... Fine. At least you have seen No, I, I, I desperately... I need to print out the, like, the top, you know, AFI's 100 because, uh, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I neglected after telling my Maltese Falcon story to play this. Harry, what is it? The uh, stuff that dreams are made of. Huh? <laughs> One of the greatest movie yeah. lines of all time. Our pal, Bogey. Uh, let's see, some other cool film noir. Another uh, One that I stumbled on fairly recently, within the last five years or so. I'd never heard of it. I'd never seen it. Um, it was recommended to me, and I sat down and watched it. It's called Out of the Past. 1947, starring uh, an amazing cast, Robert Mitchum, Kirk Douglas, Jane Greer. Uh, basically, wow. a private eye is trying to escape his past. He's working at a gas station in a small town, and his past, as they say, comes back to haunt him, and he must return to the big city world of danger, corruption, double-crosses, and 
duplicitous dames. Um, so, yeah, if you get a chance, check out Out of the Past. Uh, it, it makes a lot of top ten lists uh, when I go looking online. And when I finally sat down and watched it, I was not disappointed. Yep. It's just great. Well, so, I mean, let's look at this. Rushmore only has four spots, Jim. So, I mean, <laughs> I know. I know this, we're going to lose some all-stars here. Well, if looking at my list, if I was to put together my Mount Rushmore, Laura would be on it, uh, Maltese Falcon, Probably out of the past and maybe double indemnity. That might be my Mount Rushmore. Um, but, That's man, fair. there's some others I might have to chisel in there. Uh, there's one. Again, I, I there was a – you were talking about, like, 80s noir and stuff. There was a film that came out when I was young. I think it was in the 80s. And then I found out it was a remake of a movie that was made in 1946 called The Postman Always Rings yeah. Twice. Now, the remake had Jack Nicholson and Jessica Lange in it. Uh, the original had Lana Turner oh. and John Garfield. Well, Lana Turner was at her absolute peak in this movie. Like, they do these, you know, soft focus close-ups of her. And I'm like, oh, my God, she's so stunningly beautiful in this movie. Um, but, again, this has all the classic elements. John Garfield is a drifter who drifts into this diner. Uh, he sees the, the owner of the diner has is married to Lana Turner. And, he, you know, he's like, what are you doing with this guy? And so he applies for a job at this diner. He gets a job at the diner, gets very, very close to his wife, who then – uh, collaborate to try to take gotcha. out the husband. And again, there's twists and turns and stuff, but wow, what a good one. You know, Andrew, I think you mentioned this earlier when we started the topic, that it's, it was also about location. And do you, in your opinion, do you guys think there's a difference between New York film noir and L.A. film noir because of the way the cities are designed? I've heard that to, yeah. to a LA, certain, to, a LA certain is more extent. sunny. Yeah, yeah. You have a nice, you know, you know both, Th both have a coast, obviously. but Th yeah. think Think of... Chinatown, which came out in what seventy four, but takes place in the thirties. Yeah, where there has to do with the, the city growing out in the desert, and they need the water. Exactly. You know, that would not be happening in Manhattan in the nineteen thirties. Exactly. It'd be a completely different type Especially of situation with the boroughs situ yeah. situation. Very urban cities already built. You know, you're dealing with immigrants, whereas in LA is just kind of spreading out. Yeah, um, absolutely. Okay. That, yeah, that. I mean, it would be different in Chicago, too. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Now, you know, since you mentioned uh, Chinatown, that's another example of a movie where I don't necessarily know exactly what's going on. Like, how do you make uh, a war over water rights exciting? <laughs> but it's a great movie, a classic movie. But in the end, I'm more engrossed with the performances. Yeah. Nicholson, I don't know if he won an Oscar. If not, he should have. I think he got nominated um, at least. Yeah, but it, it's a great movie, but it's like, it's about water rights. Like, who cares it, about it, water rights? But it's also the same with uh, Roger Rabbit because they're building a freeway, you know, exactly. through that part of town. Through yeah. town. They just needed that device. Yeah. Exactly. You know, but yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I get what you're along. saying. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so it's a great movie, but uh, okay, whatever. <laughs> I tune out when they start talking the, about the, water. The, right? the political scientist in me appreciated it. Well, <laughs> yeah. let, me ask you, let me ask you guys this question when it comes to film noir. Because we cited all the murders that were happening in the 20s, especially the, the high-profile murders and how some of them went, you know, kept going throughout the decades, you come to now, you think about the, the anyone basically under 30, what's their noir? Will they be able to tell noir stories based on what's going on in the 80s, 90s? Like... Does it, I does think it have so. to go by that? Or? It's kind of a dream of mine. It's like, you know, I've done some short films and stuff like that. We have our ONTB Film Festival coming up in a few months, and I thought it'd be fun to shoot a Lake Orion noir film using, you know, the back alley in downtown Lake Orion and, yeah. you know, maybe shoot it in black and white and have the protagonist walk around in a fedora and a trench coat. So I think there are lots of stories that can be told using those elements but telling new stories. I, I don't think we'll ever see that genre because I'm wondering, I'm wondering if social media has the, the vibe of shows, social media has changed the perception because I I, I guess I, I didn't fully understand the question the question well because let me ask you this okay so you, you take all the murders that happened in the 20s and then they wanted to table that because it was all based off what the corruption in Hollywood right mm -hmm. the mur the, the LA cop 
police were not going to investigate. You know, hey, that guy has a bullet wound in his head. Suicide. Really? It's a, it's a suicide? There's a bullet hole in his head. <laughs> no, and then everybody, you know, the Hollywood, the studio fixers would come in, in the case of uh, yeah, yeah. William Desmond Taylor. Okay. Yeah. So now think about it. Are there any fixers that we know of? Are there, is everything? I'm all, sure that stuff's I mean, still happening. Today. I mean, I mean, look at, look at the, in politics, everything leaks. Mm-hmm. It's almost impossible to maintain yeah. kind of like, you know, you can, now everyone's done it. Yeah. It just goes on Twitter. It's like, a, yeah, and a, you know, talk about social media and stuff. You can take those noir elements and then use this modern technology to tell a noirish story. There I have a go. story I can share with you guys, and, and I wanted to sort of work this into my own little short film or whatever. But there's there's a period where I was on uh, in chat rooms a lot, and I was just chatting with people all over the world. And sometimes there would be a female that I would start chatting with, and the first question you ask is, you know, do you got a photo? Do you got a photo? And uh, And so... This woman, she didn't have a webcam at the time, but she's like, I'll send you a picture. So she sends me a picture through the chat room uh, of an attractive brunette. And I'm like, oh, she's cute. Now, I had just learned that Google does this like reverse image search where if someone sends you a photo and says, this is me, you can throw it into Google and see if that photo exists online. And one time a woman sent me a photo and I said, uh, this is Jennifer Love Hewitt. And she said, who, who's that? So she sent me a photo of Jennifer Love Hewitt and didn't know who Jennifer Love Hewitt was. Well, this brunette, she sends me this picture. I send it through the reverse uh, Google image search and nothing comes up, which is a good sign. So we're chatting and chatting. I said, you got any more pictures? She sends me another one. I do the reverse image search as we're talking, you know, and nothing comes up. She sends me another one. Nothing comes up fourth one she sends me gets a hit and i'm like oh this isn't good so i click on the link that google provides based on the reverse image search and it takes me to an obituary oh boy and the obituary has this uh, woman's name on it who is not the name of the woman i'm chatting with so then i google the woman's name in the obituary which one of the links takes me to her face facebook page not only are all the photos that this woman has been sending me on her Facebook page, but everyone's expressing their condolences about this young woman who had recently been killed. Now, this is a true story. This this happened to me. Right. That has all kinds of yeah, noir elements absolutely. using modern technology. So yes. the stories are still out there. So that's catfish. the nugget of a novel right there. Yeah. That's is that, is that almost like in the veil of being catfished almost? Oh, extent? that's exactly. I, what I'm that sure is, wh- yeah. whoever uh, hacked my Facebook account uh, <laughs> six weeks ago, I, I have catfished thousands of people. <laughs> I still I still have not got that under control. I still get uh, messages several times a week. Hey Andrew, did did your old account? Uh, Ask me my phone number. Oh, uh, no. I have your phone number. You're texting me right now. Yeah, no, yeah. report them. See, uh, you gotta you gotta take that experience and turn it into something yeah. positive and write write a story I, about that. Like I think it'd be a, a hiring a, funny a PI. To do. Hire a PI yeah, to find out who hacked your account and then get revenge on the guy. You know, <laughs> and and, the and, and just like. Have it be like a slasher movie and just kill him. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, be more clever than <laughs> noir. Noir, Andrew. The, watch the PI ends up finding the person they fall in love and they want to hatch a plan to come back at you. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, I I, uh, I was catfished one time. This is a different woman. I've been catfished a few times. <laughs> and uh, she refused to reveal her true identity to me. And the, th- the, the exact thought occurred to me of hiring a PI and sending a PI out to where she claimed to live and see if somehow this PI can find out who this person is. And again, that's the nugget of a noir story because this kind of happened a little bit in uh, Something About Mary where Ben Stiller hired Matt Dillon to uh, tail uh, uh, Cameron Diaz and the detective kind of falls in love with the girl. And so I thought that would be kind of a neat premise for a noir film is someone gets catfished, they hire a detective to try and find the woman's true identity and finds out that you can even she's hear the voice smoking over. hot. You can even hear the voiceover catfish. She used to be, <laughs> used to be my Saturday night dinner. Now it's apparently a <laughs> with the net. That's People right. sending pictures. What's this world coming to? <laughs> <laughs> so there are nuggets of modern day tales using uh, today's Because I technology. hope that genre doesn't go away. That's what no. I'm concerned about. Because uh, I know it, sometimes not everything. Yeah, I, 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 I think 
I think uh, we're, we'll see uh, an upswing. Um, I, I, I just came across this uh, article. I sent it to you, Nick. Uh, text. Uh, it's supposedly being put into production. I, we, I might have mentioned this before. Uh, For Spider-Man, yeah. A, a live-action Spider-Man, noir, like black and white noir. Oh, the one that was voiced by uh, Nick Cage? Nick Cage. But it, they have announced, um, uh, you know... As of uh, a couple months ago, they they haven't announced. Well, the writer strike, I'm sure, is holding everything up. But I would pay money to see that story. Yeah, I would live live action too, not not animated, live action. So yeah, I'm I'm across the Spider Verse movie. He was one of my favorite characters in that Spider Verse. That has the potential of being an excellent series. Yeah, series, Andrew. Franchise. <laughs> okay. Franchise. You, you have to start saying these well, right. Uh, hey, <laughs> you, you, you got to start with the, and then, hey, maybe with the movie. Yet. The F word is not a dirty word in, in Hollywood. No, no. So I have a few more movies on my list, and looking at some of these titles, I'm rethinking my Mount Rushmore. Uh, you talked about it at the very beginning of the podcast, Sunset Boulevard, 1950, another one directed by Billy Wilder, starring uh, Gloria Swanson and William Holden as her boy toy. And the mo- the fascinating thing about that, and this isn't necessarily a spoiler because it's the very beginning of the movie, but you see this body floating in the pool and there's this narration. And then the narration is like, you see that body in the pool? That's me. And it's like, well, then how are you narrating this film? <laughs> and so it's a gimmick, but right. it's, it's captivating. And, and it's been, it became iconic. Yeah. And, and when you were asking about the difference between, let's say, L.A. Noir and, and New York Noir, the cool thing about L.A. Noir is, is now you can incorporate the, the film world because Nora Desmond is this aging, silent film star. And again, some of the greatest lines in movie history. One, one of the best lines in there. Which, my close up, Mr. Dick. That, yeah, that's one of the great ones. And I, and I love the line when she goes back to her old studio and the guard or whatever says, uh, hey, you're Nora Desmond. You used to be big. And she goes, I am big. It's the pitches that got small. Exactly. And that's a great, great line. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and, and the cool thing about Sunset Boulevard, there's a poker game in the film, and it has some of the great silent film stars in it, um, like Buster Keaton and stuff. We're all sitting around playing poker in there. But, uh, yeah, just a, another great Classic, classic movie that uh, should be in anyone's top ten list. Um, some other movies to throw out. Uh, the Asphalt Jungle uh, came out in 1950, directed by uh, John Huston. Oh, yeah. Uh, and this this is mostly a heist movie, but it does have noir elements because, uh, like, one of the movies that you were talking about earlier, The, the Killing, yeah. in this movie... They hire a team to pull off this heist, but then as people start getting nervous, they don't trust each other, they start turning on each other, that sort of thing. Um, and so they're double-crossing each other and stabbing each other in the back. But the one of the, the interesting things about Asphalt Jungle is a young uh, blonde actress at the beginning of her career has a small part in it. Uh, her name is Marilyn Monroe. Oh, no. And she appeared in the film before she her star took off, and once her star took off, like before this movie got released, uh, she was featured prominently on the movie poster, even though she has a very small role in the film. Hey, they but, knew what they were selling. But they put <laughs> Marilyn on the poster to get uh, get the butts in the seats. And uh, I think that's one poster I'm going to have to try to dig up and hang on my wall because uh, just the story behind it. Uh, another movie came out in 1945 called Detour. Uh, not big names. Uh, main actors are Tom Neal and Ann Savage, who reportedly did not get along on set. Um, he's a New York nightclub pianist who uh, hitchhikes to Hollywood to uh, meet up with his girl. Uh, he gets picked up on a rainy night by a sleazy gambler who mysteriously dies en route. And so now the hitchhiker is like, well, I don't want to get blamed for this. So... I don't know if anyone would do this in real life, but in the film, he ends up taking the guy's identity or something and uh, things get out of hand and blow up and one thing happens and spins out of control. So um, that's one I just discovered and watched for the first time recently. And it was very, very entertaining. Uh, Another movie that has kind of an interesting connection to real life. A movie came out in 1946 called The Blue Dahlia. 
and uh, it stars Alan Ladd and Veronica Lake. Uh And um, I don't remember much about the storyline, but what I do remember about the film is about a year later, the Black Dahlia, the Black Dahlia, uh, got murdered. And when people say, well, who came up with the name Black Dahlia? I don't think there's any coincidence that the Blue Dahlia had come out a year before. And usually movies played in theaters for the better part of the year. Right. So I think because of her raven black hair and the the movie was fresh in people's memories, they just kind of put a twist on that. I think the press is the one who came up with that. Um, But that's an interesting connection to real life, even though when you watch the movie, obviously it has nothing to do with the famous murder, but it's, it's, it's kind of a fascinating footnote that there's a connection there. Um, let's see some other titles in a lonely place, uh, 1950 starring Humphrey Bogart, another great film where he's, you know, usually you want to like Humphrey Bogart in most of his movies, but in a lonely place, his character is not likable. And it's fascinating to see him play the heel, um, because usually he's the guy you sort of root for in a film. Right. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's one we haven't touched on. I think this might be my last one. Uh, Touch of Evil uh, came out in 1958, directed by Orson Welles, who also plays a role in it. And Charlton Heston uh, plays a Hispanic guy in the movie. <laughs> Why Janet Leigh, uh, mother of, uh, of Jamie Lee Curtis, uh, she's in it. She's stunning in it. And it's basically about story of murder, kidnapping, police corruption in a uh, Mexican border town. An interesting footnote about this is that the character that Orson Welles plays, who's kind of a scruffy, overweight police detective sort of a thing who is corrupt, uh, that character inspired the character of Eckhart in Batman. So you remember when the Joker says, Hey, Eckhart, think about the future. That character looks and acts and sounds exactly like uh, Orson Welles' character in A Touch of Evil. And also what's interesting about it, for someone like me who uh, likes visiting film locations, it was filmed at Venice Beach. And a lot of the buildings that you see in the in the film are gone now, but there are some remnants of some of the architecture at Venice Beach. And when you wander away from the beach and check out the streets where all the shops and restaurants and stuff are, uh, you see hints of a touch of evil in the streets of Venice. As a matter of fact, somebody painted a giant mural along the side of the wall of an entire building. Uh, that's a, uh, I think it says a touch of Venice on it, but it has uh, uh, portraits wow. of characters and stuff on it. So they embrace right, right. the fact that the movie was filmed uh, in Venice. And so it's a really cool real life location that you can visit. And, If you get a chance and and watch it, note that the opening sequence is one of the longest tracking shots, like unedited tracking shots in film history. And the camera sort of follows Charlton Heston walking down these streets. And there's some activity going on around them that you don't realize is significant until... Uh, something happens, and then you you got to go back and watch it again and go, oh, yeah, I see it all now happening in the background as you, they're you're walking. You're thinking uh, Alan Sorkin, West Wing uh, inspiration. Yeah, they, yeah. They Long, shot. unedited tracking shots. You know, I, I've often wondered about this. We talk about film noir. Was there another genre that they were it was juxtaposed? Because when I think of all these movies that came out in the 40s and, and 50s, I think Gene Kelly, mm-hmm. very very happy. Very, his, his movies were very different. Mm-hmm. In tone and everything, and then you say, as Gene Kelly movies come out, I'm like, oh, I want to go see these movies. And then you want to go see Humphrey Bogart in a very. It's almost like when we see right now Barbie Oppenheimer. Uh-huh. When people are like, oh, we got to see Bar- Barbie Oppenheimer. <laughs> the same like, no, I wouldn't. I would never see those two movies together. They're two very different movies. Like, yeah, one thing I love about Bogey is he had a type. Obviously, he was typecast as the tough guy, and he embraced it and he accepted it, and it made him rich and famous and married one of the most beautiful women on the planet at the time. Um, I love the fact that he embraced his role and gave the audience what they wanted. Um, Reading that Errol Flynn uh, autobiography, uh, that character that you saw him portray in his films were studio creations that he wanted nothing to do with. And if you said to his face, hey, swashbuckler, he probably would have knocked you on your ass. 
Um, he wanted to do other things, and he was very unhappy in Hollywood, and that kind of breaks my heart because he was so good at it. And some of those movies he did, like Captain Blood and Robin Hood, are, some, in my opinion, some of the greatest have, movies ever made. Have you Studio come, contract. Have you come across anything in the book or read anywhere else where he has mentioned, like, his favorite roles, like roles he actually did. Enjoy. I don't know if he was necessarily happy with anything that he did. He uh, really he did That's... come back. Like he got away from Hollywood for a little bit, and then came back later in his life and got a few roles when he was kind of down and out on his luck. He had some ex wives who were bilking him dry, right? And so he had to come back to Hollywood to make some money to pay off debts and and alimony and stuff like that. And and so he did some films toward the end of his life um, that weren't the swashbuckling type and so i don't know if he takes pride in those or it was just a paycheck to him but yes, i wonder um, i wonder if he would have done well in noir i feel like he would have oh i, like I think he wouldn't, so. wouldn't have yeah. the talent to do well it's like clark yeah Gable. Clark yeah Gable, you wouldn't you can't imagine him in a lot of he's not he's not the first name that comes to mind when you say film noir right? yeah yeah exactly there were certain types alan ladd uh dana andrews um you know uh Kurt Douglas had a couple of great films from from around that. Like he he did an amazing movie called um, uh, well, what is it? Oh darn it! He plays a Hollywood uh, executive. The Bad and the Beautiful is the name okay. of the movie, and he plays like a former Hollywood director, producer, something like that, who pissed off a lot of people, and he's sort of down and out on his luck, and he tries to bring these people back and say, I, I got an idea that'll put me back on my feet and they're like go to hell <laughs> and it's it's great and it, it has some film noir elements too because he's such a beast he's he betrays all his friends and love interests and everything so kurt douglas is another one that's great in that 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 role joe do they have a film noir tour in in hollywood is there such a thing i haven't heard of anything like that but i i can probably take you on one the uh i mean of course you (laughs) the house that was featured prominently in double indemnity is still standing and i see people post pictures of it all the time and um you know there's cool seedy dark alleys and stuff as a matter of fact um just recently and let's we only have a couple minutes left and you, you suggested we end on this note i was recently watching peewee's big adventure yeah. uh in honor of paul rubens who just passed away and uh as i'm watching the film there's a scene after his bike is stolen where he's in a, it's raining and he's in a dark alley and he's got his collar pulled up and some uh tough guys approach him and he he hisses at them and they all run away (laughs) screaming and i paused the film at that point because it was this cool rainy dark alley and i'm like that looks very very familiar and so i paused the movie i pulled out my phone i scrolled back to a time uh when i was in la i think it was 2018 i did the warner brothers tour and i took a photo of that alley and i held it up and compared it to the image that i had paused on my screen and it was the exact same alley and i've since found out that lots of films including noir films were filmed in that alley i I saw your post on uh, facebook yeah yeah and one of the most famous moments that that were filmed in that alley which is kind of cool is um mary jane uh from the first spider-man movie is running through that alley and spider-man saves her and then he comes upside down and she pulls the mask and gives him that famous upside down kiss and you said that was warner brothers warner brothers lot okay they use the fire escape and that fire escape someone pointed out to me is featured on the cover of purple rain with (laughs) prince sitting on his motorcycle is filmed in that exact same spot so it's really fascinating that so many iconic moments were filmed in that that, that's what film noir is known for like city hall in la and then also yeah. uh, the, the trolley, like the, you're like, hey, I've seen that before. Yeah, there were some sites they just always come back to. Yeah. yeah, there's a there's a cool little location that was seen in La La Land. Uh, it's called Angel's Flight, and it's like a a long car, like a train car. I think they said it's the shortest distance a train travels in the United States, and it only goes up one flight on this hill but it's been in la for decades and decades and man it would be a perfect setting for a a, a murder it's really cool it's and very because old when you school. see those things you think la automatically there's some things you see and you say la outside the capitol building and Hollywood yeah mm-hmm. yeah but city hall all that stuff yeah. yeah it shows up in so many movies so well we're just about out of time yes and another great uh, episode and the music is a perfect way to get us out of here. Yes. Very noirish. <laughs> so that was fun. And uh, I'm sure next time we meet in this podcast room, we'll get back to unsolved murders and mysteries and crimes. 
Uh, we have some interesting things coming up we want to talk about. This November is the 60th anniversary of the assassination of John F. That's Kennedy. Correct. So yes. we may talk about some movies and things that have addressed that. I'm looking forward to getting it in with you guys, yes. uh, getting into it. Yes. And Absolutely. so we have some other ideas. We will see you again soon. Maltese Falcon out. <laughs> Good night, everybody.